Welcome to Opto Sessions, where we interview the brightest minds from the stock market, uncovering their secrets to success. If you're looking for ideas, tips and techniques from the world's best, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Opto Sessions. I'm your host, Ed Gotham, and our next guest needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Jack Schwager author of the hugely popular and widely acclaimed Market Wizard series. Jack is a recognized industry expert in futures and hedge funds, and more recently has also stepped into the world of entrepreneurship as a founder of Fundseeder, a platform to find talented traders and connect them with sources of capital. We dive into the Market Wizard series with special insight into the minds of prolific hedge fund wizards, Ray Dalio, Stanley Druckenmiller, and Paul Tudor-Jones, we close the interview by revealing some of the stories you'll want to read about his upcoming release, Unknown Market Wizards. Enjoy. Hello, Jack. It's a, a pleasure to finally talk to you in person. Uh, how's everything going where you are? Pretty good. I'd like to start with, in an area, um, I know probably uh, most people start the Market Wizards uh, section with individuals, but on the investing misconceptions area, so I know you've explored that in detail with a, a lot of the people you've worked with. Can you possibly take us through a couple of people, uh, misconceptions from, from the people you, you've um, taught, interviewed over the years? Yeah, you know, well, on misconception, I guess I would just draw on personal experience on this one. And actually I wrote a whole book called Market Sense and Nonsense where, which the whole point of the whole focus of the book was on misconceptions. Uh, but let me just pick a few of them. And let's take one that just about all investors fall prey to, which is overemphasis on more recent returns. And so if you take it from, I'll take it from two standpoints, one from, ind from index funds or just general investing in the stock market, let's say, and another would be, let's say, on hedge fund reform. It's the same principle, but they're different points. So, you know, most people, if you look at his, where inflows go, they usually are biggest after you've had a long bull run in the markets. And if you look at the, what happens 10 years, 15 years, 20 years forward, and I've done the analysis, the worst performing periods come, not surprisingly, after you've had you know, really good performance. And the best performance horizons are when the market's done really terrible. So if you look at, if you invest when the market has done really lousy for the last five years, or the last 10 years relative to history, and I, I've took these numbers all the way back, to the 1850s, you do best by investing for the longer term when the market has done really badly in recent years, which is the opposite of what most people do. And when you take it something like hedge funds, the interesting thing, I did a study is not particular hedge funds, but sectors, it's like about 30 plus sectors based on HFRI. So I did a study where you took the best hedge funds of the last performance, the best sector, of the last three or five years, uh, or best one, three and five years, and the worst one in three or five years performing sector. And if you looked at what happened over the future horizon, like in, when you invest in one of those, you found that on return risk basis, you actually did better investing in the worst performing sector of, the, of recent years, averaging those the one, three and five, than if you invested in the best one. And that sounds counterintuitive, but the explanation is easy is because the sectors that have outperformed are the ones that had a wide, it's part of reversion to the mean. They've had a wide move away from some historical norm. That's why they've outperformed. So let's say oil or something like that. If oil has a real big run and done really, really well, oil sector or energy sector, I should say, will be the, one of the top performers. Vice versa, it's done really, really poorly. So what you end up when you're picking a particular hedge fund, you're picking one that is focused on a certain sector. The ones that perform best a lot of times are those who just happen to be in the right sector. And that's true also on stock sectors, by the way. It's not just hedge funds. So again, it's kind of counterintuitive that if you pick the best performing ones, you actually end up doing worse than average. And sometimes worse than, the bet than picking the worst performing ones. So that's one big misconception area. Uh, another one, which is really pertinent to, to just alternative investment, 
is this conf confusion between volatility and risk. Sort of it's become almost synonymous to, to think of risk in terms of volatility. Now that works sometimes. Uh, if you get the stock market very, very volatile, then it's gonna be more risky than periods when the stock market is fairly calm. That part of it is works. But where it doesn't work is you have investing areas or strategies which can have very low volatility, but can be very, very risky uh, in what I call hidden risk. It's a type of risk that isn't visible all the time, but it's just sporadically on it when an event occurs, that the risk shows up. So classic example, strategy, you have hedge funds a lot or CTAs out there, lots of them. The strategy is they sell way out of the money uh, options. And that looks great most times. It's just like a, a money machine until you get something like March. And then those type of strategies get decimated. And people don't realize it. They look, they look at return or return to risk. It looks like the great return to risk. It looks like the risk is very low because the volatility is low. But the low volatility is misleading. It's low in broad periods, but then that very, the, 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 the thing that makes it low volatility, in this case, say I'm selling way out of the money options, you're not gonna lose unless there's a really big event. So it looks like there's not much volatility. But if you get the event and your track record doesn't include a prior event, then you have this explosion in volatility. So the, so the risk is there, but it's not visible if you're just using historical numbers. So that's another classic misconception. Uh, very interesting. Um, and for, for people, I mean, a lot of people on this podcast will, will sort of know, know you already, but um, if you give us like a brief overview for anyone who, that, that doesn't know, but obviously you're quite well, uh, very well known in, in this area. Sure, sure, it's a brief bio, like, I mean, it's just very short, as short as I can make it. Uh, so most people know me from the Mark Wizards books, you know, there are five, you know, I just have the fifth one coming out. Um, I've also written other more analytical books. I won't have to reel them off. Uh, as far as non-author type of uh, endeavors, most of my original career was as a research analyst in futures, uh, actually a little over 20 years as a research director uh, in futures for firms like Smith Barney and Prudential Beige. Then I spent 10 years at a hedge fund advisory firm. And more recently, I've been involved in a uh, startup called Fundseeder. So that's kind of as brief as I can make a, a career, which is now <laughs> years long. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. And um, what primarily what you, what were you doing as, a, as an analyst on futures, by the way? I, I just Well, I started, you know, first two years, I was just a straight analyst and I was analyzing markets like sugar and cotton and, uh, and livestock. And then I became a research director and I was basically responsible for all futures market research. Okay. Oh, brilliant. And what, what is a market wizard in your own sort of words for you? Okay. So what I look for, um, you know, a lot of when I do a search for market wizards, people get, and I, this last time around, I use social media to help for the search. And I also use Fundseeder. But if I'm using social media, people coming back and they, they, they send me, oh, I kind of make 500% last year. Well, you know, in a track record is one year and I, they they turn twenty thousand into hundred thousand. Okay, great. But I mean that's not what I'm looking for. So what I'm looking for is first of all longer term records. I make rare exceptions, but generally, you know, ten years plus, twenty years plus is even better. But I'm looking for longer track records. So it's not just a somebody got lucky a year or two, right? Uh, I'm looking for not just high returns, or not as I always high returns. So I'm looking for people who've done very, very return, very well, return to risk. So, um, and by return to risk, you know, I'm, you know, I'm getting to the tension of what measures I use. I don't, I don't use the sharp ratio per se, but you can think in terms of something like the sharp ratio. And uh, I'm looking for people who've made very, very good return while having, you know, their drawdowns are well controlled. I look more in terms of, the metrics I use are more focused on losses as opposed to volatility. So I'm looking for people who've generated extremely good return 
relative to the losses they take in along the way to get those returns. And sometimes, it, it, you know, in some cases where people just may have high, vol high risk as well, but if they're not really exceptional, that's enough by itself too. So uh, I, like in the book, upcoming book, I have somebody who turned literally, literally turned like $5,000 into 50 million. So, wow. yeah, so that's good enough, you know? <laughs> you don't have to worry too much. But the return risk is still good. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But it's yeah. not the exceptional return risk. In that case, it's just the exceptional uh, multiplication of money. And you, you managed to verify this through... Oh, yeah, at yeah. Trading accounts. yeah. So, yeah. in fact, this particular person came through an email to me. And my natural inclination is, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, but, you know, so what I'm saying, I'm willing to say, okay, well, you know, uh, can you prove this? And, uh, well, I got all the statements, so, which is a pain because I got to go, I got to make, got to get up like reams of monthly statements. And yeah, yeah. Excel sheets. But yeah, I can't take these numbers on face value. Yeah, yeah. And there were traders. Now, this particular person, if you get the returns, what they worked out here, they were triple digit probably. Uh, but this is a longer record. This goes back to like tw almost 20 years. But I had some traders who had more like 10, 12 year records. And I had two traders in the book who had for the, over that period, unbelievably like 300% annual returns, you know, uh, annual. Consistently. And so I, numbers like that, you have to get statements because they're just not believable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they must be using some sort of leverage. Well, they were very aggressive. These particular two traders I'm thinking of are extremely aggressive, but not all the time, just particular points in time. And they just yeah. pick their shots. Yeah, They're extraordinarily good in picking their shots. And when they do, they go in very heavy. And, they, and, they're, and they're very, very good at getting out extremely quickly if they're not right. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And um, I thought like to go and talk about Ray Dalio now, which is obviously one of the people that you've um, interviewed in the Market Wizard series. So obviously Ray Dalio is the um, illustrious founder of uh, Bridgewater Associates, one of the most successful hedge funds of all time, having generated over $57.8 billion for investors, probably the most well-known uh, hedge fund investor nowadays. The funds at Bridgewater are completely fundamentally based and apply a systematic approach to fund management. Um, I think he's, Quoted, or your quote in your book is 99% of decisions made by a computer um, no, using no technical signals and inputs to their models at all. Can you describe this sort of approach in more detail and, and why you think? Yeah, I mean, it's rather extraordinary um, for me because I did not think, well, two things that are extraordinary about uh, Bridgewater is one, I would have thought, I, not I would have, I did think it would be totally impossible for a hedge fund to manage the types of assets they manage and be able to do it without blow, without getting in their own way. I, I, it is extraordinary that they have had such good results with such enormous amount of money. The Bridgewater is by no means the best, anywhere near the best return fund or the best return risk fund, but nobody comes close in terms of having made money for investors because of the enormous amounts of money they manage and manage at a and with good with good performance stats. So that's one way they're unbelievable. The other way is I would have thought that and I and I in my career have used both fundamental and technical analysis and I never was able to make fundamental one problem I had fundamental analysis I couldn't make it work timing wise. So I'm surprised that you know one could actually build such a successful fund where it's really based on fundamentals which and trading, which should depend on timing. So how, what do they do? Um, well, of course, you know, I'm not gonna, they're not gonna tell, <laughs> give you the cookbook, but essentially, essentially, the key, to, to, the key to what they do, I can say there's two things that they do. One is Ray Dalio, if he is anything, is an historian. So I think in the book, I have a line like, what do you call an analysis uh, of every, of all of the market from the whole entire post-World War II period from Dalio's perspective? And I think my line was myopic. 
because his, I mean, that is almost short. That's not short term, but it's more short term. He, he will literally go back hundreds of years or as far as data can go. And so there are markets that may have occurred, let's say in the 1800s, that or even the you know, first half of the, of the 20th century, people will not have any knowledge or, or, or fact that they didn't. But Dalio knows those markets. And so that's all factored in. And he, one of the things they, that he does because he's such a student of history is to divide markets into different types of markets. Let's say a market where there is inflation and growth, or is a different type of market where there's no inflation and growth. Uh, so, and, and his point is that any given fundamental input will behave differently depending on the category of market. So one of the things he's done through his knowledge of history is to categorize different types of markets by combinations, say, of stuff, of things like inflation and growth, also by monetary policy. So he may look at countries like, uh, uh, if a country's a creditor nation or a debtor nation, uh, and does it control its own currency or doesn't it? Different combinations of those, again, are different and the same fundamental factor will affect those combinations differently. So that's one of the things that go into that model is it's not, it's not all the same. The same fundamental will have different implications in different countries and in different, uh, in different combinations of prevailing macro trends. So that's one big element. Another element is that defines who Dalio is and what he's made Bridgewater is this emphasis on learning from mistakes. So whenever something doesn't work, there's all sorts of analysis of why it didn't work and how can the model be changed, not to make it work in that particular instance, but what can we learn? What did we miss out of that? What, in that mistake, what, was, what mistake did we make? What, what wasn't in the model that we can learn? So throughout this whole career of 40 years plus, He's constantly revising the model to learn the things that were missing that show up because something doesn't work. So that's another big element of what makes up that model. Do you remember any examples of, of, of mistakes he's used to, as a new input to his model? Nothing comes to mind. Well, just like from his own personal experience, I, like, uh, I think the beginning of the bull market, it was around 82, the stock market. And uh, there were some, some bearish news that came out. I forget it was, uh, I forget what the, even the, it was a big bearish news item. I forget what it was. And he came in thinking, well, boy, the market's going to get killed. And he went short. And not only did it get killed, not only did it go up, but it just, that was the beginning of a long term bull market. This fundamental fact that he thought would affect the market one way, in a certain environment, could affect it the other way. That was a specific had a major impact on him. And, and also the knowledge that the timing of fundamental news can actually, if the market's behaving in, in a inverse way, can itself be a, a major signal. Yeah. And I, I believe um, I've, I've read it, bits of his book, uh, Principles as well. And one of, one of the other things that he has, uh, believability weighted decisions. So he, he never trusts his opinion totally and validates it by getting the opinions of other people he trusts to see if they have similar ideas or if it contradicts. And then, you know, he, he can go and test his idea to, to see, see how likely it is to be right. Um, and I believe that's something else he's integrated into to the, the culture at, at Bridgewater. Is there, is there any other notable things? Yeah, it's part of that culture is to challenge, you know, to challenge any ideas or to, you know, how can I be wrong type, being open to being wrong being proven. Yeah. Are there any other parts of the culture that you think were important as well? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I imagine, well, the culture is part of this learning from the mistakes and part of everybody kind of being able to call somebody else out. So, I, yeah, I, I think that's part of it. It's, uh, you don't want, he creates an environment where anybody can challenge, can be challenged, including himself. And so people are not only not discouraged from speaking out, but are encouraged to, if they yeah. have something to contribute. And um, 
he's almost also famous. Uh, well, the fund is also famous for having zero correlation to traditional markets and a low correlation to other hedge funds, uh, which is based around this theory that return risk ratio um, in, improves by holding uncorrelated assets. Um, are you able to just touch on sort of Ray's commitment to? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly diversification is, he's a, you know, Dalio's a great believer in diversification. He likes, he likes to draw this graph. Back when I was interviewing him, he went to his blackboard and drew this graph about how, you know, how the uh, risk comes down with the more, the more uncorrelated assets you have and how big that down curve is. So he's definitely a big believer in it. Uh, there's no question. I mean, that's, it's almost a mathematical truism that that's, that that's correct. Um, the tough part is doing it. And I did ask him how, how he does it and how do you manage it uh, when assets become correlated. And basically, the point is that a lot of their so-called assets are not single assets, but they're one asset versus the other. So, for example, um, the behavior of, uh, of Scandinavian bonds versus European bonds or, or a specific country in Scandinavia versus a specific country uh, in Europe, that bond, that main, while each of those bonds may itself be correlated to other main markets, the ratio of those bonds to each other or the, relay, or the spread difference between each other, that may not be correlated. So a lot of what he's a lot of what they do is they get paired assets, or I would assume maybe even maybe even more than two assets as a, as a so-called single investment, and um, and that particular combination may have low correlation, even if each leg of it may be correlated to other markets. So that's part of the way they yeah, achieve. Yeah, yeah. No, I think an that. important part. Um, Another person you uh, interviewed, um, I, I believe in one of the earlier books, was Stanley Druckenmiller. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, obviously a notorious American hedge fund founder, famous, among other things, for shorting the British pound whilst working for George Soros at the Quantum Fund. Um, that's rumoured to have earned one billion, I believe, in profit just from that, that single trade. Um, can you describe Stanley's top-down sort of investing approach? Yeah. So... Um, as opposed to like a type of hedge fund that um, will, you know, buy and really focus in on, on individual stocks and do a lot of that. He may have individual stocks, but his big thing is to get the main market trend. So uh, he learned early in his career uh, where he started out as a long only analyst or a long only uh, portfolio manager for somebody else. And he found that that was a big handicap having to always be long. Uh, and when he started his own fund, he got bearish, at the, I think, early on. And he went 50%. He brought his long down to 50% long. But he still lost money on that 50%. And he learned from that point on, well, why even keep 50%? If I'm really, really super bearish, why have anything long? So, so his primary thing is to get the main market direction. So what stocks or bonds, or specific currencies, uh, or I guess specific commodities even. And then, I mean, he will do some other fine tuning and he'll have maybe individual stocks, but the most important thing is to get the big trend right. So this top-down investing, that's what it means by top-down. It's more getting the main market direction right, and then you can supplement it by, by individual stock analysis. Yeah, interesting. And Stanley's famous for saying uh, the way to build superior long-term returns is through preservation of capital and home runs. You can be far more aggressive when making good profits. Yeah. So, so Druckenmiller's one of his big things is, uh, and he quotes, and I believe I forget if it's Druckenmiller's original, but I think he's he quoted, he quoted Soros here. Yeah. Um, and I think what he's saying, what he learned from Soros was it takes. And, and paraphrasing or quoting Soros, it takes courage to be a pig. Um, yeah. And by that he means when he's re and he, he tells a story in the interview where he got really, really bullish on a D mark and he had like a billion dollars, you know, he went to George Soros and tell him, and he was at that point working for Soros, Soros had hired him. And this was while 
Soros and Drakamilla were still working, investing at the same time. And there was some headbutting there as well, not because there were different approaches, but just two different personalities. And, and not long after Soros, uh, um, the Berlin Wall came down and Soros went off to Eastern Europe to try to help foster democracies in Eastern Europe and left uh, Drakamilla to run the shop. But this was at the point where uh, Drakamilla and Soros were there together. And he went into Soros and he was pitching him on why he was so bullish on the D market. And Soros uh, asked him, well, how, what's your position? He says, a billion dollars. And Soros said to him dismissively, a billion dollars? You call that a position? Meaning that if you're that bullish, why do you only have a billion dollars off? And, and that position was immensely right. And Druckermiller, you know, they had pushed it to like two or three billion after that. Uh, but he, he kind of learned that the way to really make, have a really, really good long-term track record is those times where you're right, really right, uh, or have high, high conviction, you really have to step on the accelerator. He also mm -hmm. talks about, you know, when he's, if he's a year, he's up like 30 or 40%. Most hedge funds will then typically will kind of be very cautious. I'll try to protect that, that big profit, uh, nibble at things. Uh, Druckenmiller's view is, hey, you got a 30, 40% cushion. That's when you really have the ammunition to go big if you've got the right trade. Yeah. And go for the 100% year. So because he's able to get some of these really big, really big return years, he's able to come out with a, a long-term, I think his horizon is plus 40 years, uh, but this, uh, in the, the hedge fund he ran, his own hedge fund, which he ran continually, called the Duquesne Fund, until he closed it some year, years ago. I believe he compounded it, you know, for over 30 years at over 30%. I don't remember the exact numbers, but wow. that's, good. that's close enough. Yeah, yeah. And part of that is because he had some really big years. So he could take a year where he was down 5% or something like that because he has those really big years to offset and still end up with a plus 30% compounded return. What's, what's your opinion on that? Is it, is it like, I mean, mathematically, is it better to have those massive winning years and, and a few, because I think he's famous saying like, yeah, like you said, you know, some years where he makes zero, he might be up and then comes back because he's gone big. Uh, but then he's got those huge home runs when he does hit them. Is that better than being consistent at 20%? Yeah, it's better if that if if you're good with, if you're comfortable with that type of approach. Um, look, the market. This goes to another idea, concept. Yeah, this idea of consistent, and that's one of the it's one of the themes in my new book, Undiscovered Market Wizards, that comes up a number of times in a number of interviews. Interestingly, but it's the idea that yeah, you know, this the, that consistency, looking that being a consistent trader. Well, that sounds really good. It's in many ways a, a, a misconception because the markets, the markets, as one trader said, I think it was Peter Brandt said, uh, the markets are not an annuity. It's they're not going to give you a consistent, equal space string of opportunities. There could be months where there's nothing, and then there could be, there could be. In fact, one trader said, "Hey, like last year, I made all my returns in two weeks in December and one day in July." 100% of my returns came from that. So that's what the markets are. There, there are. there are points where there are real big opportunities and there are points where there's nothing. And so it's important. So if you can do it, it's good to be able to do both. One, to really take advantage of the opportunities if you've got the confidence and the skill. And secondly, not to do anything in the, in the times where there's no opportunities. And so people who are trying to get consistency, the reason why that's bad is it'll, it'll encourage people to put on trades that are suboptimal because, hey, you know, I got to make, I got to make $10,000 this month. I got a mortgage to pay, right? And um, I haven't made anything yet. So they're looking for anything, even if the trade isn't there. So it's not a good idea to look for consistency. You know, you got to, you got to take what the market gives you. Mm -hmm. You can't dictate to the market what you want. Yeah. The market doesn't care what you want, you know, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, and the other point you made in that in that quote I, I mentioned earlier was the preservation of capital. Um, obviously, trading uh, the risk of trading size is that if you it's the wrong call, you have large losses. 
How, how does Stanley approach sort of risk management? So I don't recall, so the interview with Stanley was quite a while ago, was in, I believe it was New Market Wizards, which came out, oh, I think 92 or so. So it's quite a while ago. Uh, I don't remember him going in too much into what his risk control is, except what came out of that interview is what was his incredible flexibility to change his mind when he's wrong. Yeah. So he's not only the type of person that can, will get out very quickly when he realizes he's wrong, but he'll even reverse his position. And there was a classic story in that interview about the 87 crash, uh, which if you want, I can go into. But yeah, of course. Yeah, I think it's a nice example. This, and maybe this explains really how he controls risk as well. In 87, uh, he was with Dreyfus and he was managing like seven different funds for Dreyfus. And uh, he was bullish early in the year for the first part of the year. And then about mid-year, he turned bearish. And that was a good move because the market did begin selling off. And then there was one day uh, in one week in October where the market went down really sharply in, in the first half of October. And that Friday, uh, the Dow, I think it was the Dow, to come down to like something like 2,200. And, and it was a week, it was, the market was very weak after several months of being down. And Stan looked at it and he said, well, there should be support here. And remember, he came in short. Um, and he thought, well, this is a reasonable place to take profits. So he took profits that Friday. Um, but not only did he take profits, he thought that the market would get a technical bounce. So he went long. And in fact, he went leveraged long. And that Friday was October 16th, 1987, which will mean something to people who were around that, or people who know a little bit of stock market history. But anyway, over that weekend, and this was, this was before the big October 19th crash. So over the weekend, and this is tangential, why? But he realized that he was wrong. For multiple reasons, he realized it came to him that he had made a mistake. So he had every intention of covering his position Monday morning. The only problem was that over, by the time, you know, the markets crashed in Europe first, and by the time US opened, the markets opened down like, get like 10% lower. So now if you be interested, and then of course, on that day, October 19th, the market went down in the US and future, based on stock market, never, the tape never caught it up. But based on futures, I think it was down something like 20, 27 to 29% exact number in one day. Um, and so there was a, that was the big, biggest decline ever. And it's just extraordinary decline. Now, if you look at Stanley's performance in October of that year, he was barely down. And, and so how, do, how can you reverse from, long to, from short to leverage long on October 16th and end up not losing much? I mean, it seems impossible. Well, this, part of the answer is he was, he was short the first half of the month, so he did make money then. But the key to it was he knew he was wrong. So what does he do Monday morning? Immediately, he not only covers that entire position, 10% down or 12% down, whatever the market was when it opened, uh, he actually reversed back to short. So um, that, that just gives you an idea. To me, that's the most incredible display of trader flexibility that I ever came across in my life. But the ability to do that, uh, and very, very few people can, could do something like that. The ability to do that uh, is, is how he manages risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great example. Um, and I've got a final quote here. He says, uh, you can't win when you have to win, which, which relates to a story early on in his career uh, when he made a desperate attempt to save his firm from financial ruin. Can, can you sort of describe what, he's, what he means here? Yeah, so he had, he had just started his hedge fund. He didn't have that much on it. He had a few million under assets. Uh, he, he mounted, I think he, his, uh, his overhead for the office and for his assistant and whatever, his overhead for the year was like 150,000. Uh, his management fees uh, were only like 30,000 on what he was managing. Uh, what he was really depending on, he has one important consulting client. I think it was a firm called Drysdale Securities or whatever. And one day they blew up for whatever reason. So he lost his consulting client. 
And uh, so he had a gap between his operating expenses and the money he was drawing in. Uh, at the same time, this is, I think, 82, the same time he, this was when interest rates were really, really sky high. He was looking for, you know, a peak in interest rates and a beginning of a bull market in, in, uh, in bonds and bills and euros and so forth, euro dollars. And so what he did was he was very convinced that we were near a turning point. And so he just put the whole funds investment into, I believe it was euro dollars. Um, and the irony, of course, this was a move of desperation and he sort of was trying to save the, the firm, but he had to win. Now the irony, now four days later, he blew, the market went down some more and he blew out of that, you know, he was blown out of that position. Now short, shortly after that, the market turned around and started what is now almost a 40 year bull market. You know, you could argue we're still in it, unless we've just peaked out recently, you know. So he, he almost at the bottom of like a, a 35, 40 year bull market. To, he almost had it to within a week, but because he had to bet everything at once and he had to win and he couldn't allow himself, he had no, no leeway, he lost. And it's the idea, you, you know, one of the things I always say is people is don't, don't invest or don't trade if you can't afford to lose. If you need the money for, the mor for a mortgage, I don't care if you the world's going to straighter, you're going to lose. It's just too much of a burden. I mean, trading is hard enough, but if you have to win, yeah. you can't win. That's great. Great quote. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Been a billionaire founder of the hedge fund Tudor, uh, who shot to fame in the 80s when he successfully predicted a Black Monday crash in 1987. Um, how would you describe Paul's trading strategy, if you could sum that up, if you remember from your... Sure. And, and again, I, voted, uh, I interviewed Paul quite a while ago. And, you know, after I interviewed him, went on to find to fund, uh, to start uh, Tudor Investments and expand that and was managing, I guess, tens of billions at one point. I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't kept up with him totally. Uh, so I don't know, you know, if he, his personal trading probably remained the same, but I can't guarantee. Yes. Uh, certainly the hedge fund would have had lots of different strategies. But the way he personally traded was um, he's kind of the opposite of some of it. I would say it's the opposite of a trend follower. Uh, even though he believes in trends, but it's the opposite trend. Like he would like to probe like the, that stock market crash, which he caught in 87. He was, he thought the market was going to top. So he was probing for a short position. And that's the way he likes to trade. Uh, and, and he explains that as if you're going to go into a market when it's already trending, you're going in the middle of a trend, and you're trying to catch it. Then if you're going to, then if you're going to use a stop, a protective stop, which you should, you got to use a wide stop or it's not going to be meaningful. You know, you can have pullbacks in a trend that don't mean anything. But when you're probing, when you think the market is at a top or a bottom and you're trying to probe for it, you don't have to have too much room to get a meaningful stop. Uh, so that's his, arg his argument is that you can try to get these market turns and you can have many, you can take a lot of swings because it doesn't, you don't have to allow very much to show that that particular trade is just too early. You know, it's just, you know, not yet, not yet. So that's, that, that was his approach. You know, I assume he probably carried on, which was to try to get situations where he was looking for a major bottom or a major top. And if he's, you know, and to use relatively close stops and to keep doing it until he got it. Uh, if he was wrong a lot, then he would just reduce his position size. But essentially, that was his favorite type of trade, would be to try to identify the markets that he thought were overextended, ready for a, ready for a peak or a bottom, and to probe for those spots at, at the right times. Yep. And that goes in line with, I've, I've got a quote here, he says, to be a good trader, you have to be a contrarian. It's pretty much in line with what you're saying, I think. He's, he's, he's looking. Yeah, I mean, that's, so, yeah. So, it was that contrarian approach to, to him. And uh, I've got, 
And I've got one trader in his new book who is, who, who's, who's even more, a, who's 100% the contrary, you know, so, uh, so which is interesting. I mean, just totally, totally lives and breathes being a contrarian. You know? Also, what's amazing to me is how um, there's a lot of different, there's room for a lot of different approaches to work. Because obviously you get the trend followers as well who do well. Uh, the contrarians when they time it right it's, it's people find their sort of niche that they that works for them exactly exactly um i don't know if you i'm hoping you, you can explain this he has a trading rule don't ever average losers do, do you do you know what that means in practice and yeah i mean that's uh i mean there's a let me make a distinction here it's okay to scale down into a position if that was pre-planned, that's really the distinction. So, so if you want to buy a market, let's make a difference. One, say a market that's that's trading at fifty, and you want to buy it uh, if it dips down because you think it's going to go up. You want to buy it if it dips down to the forty-five to forty-two area, and you get a reaction, and you buy at forty-five, you buy at forty-four, you buy at forty-three, you buy at forty-two with some sort of pre-planned exit, right? Uh, stops below somewhere below 42. Nothing, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But what, what, what the, the uh, quotation you're using refers to is, okay, you buy the market, go, you buy the same market, it's 50, goes down to 45, you buy it, and that's where you think the bottom is going to be. And then it goes down to 44 and you buy more, and then because you want to get your price low with it. And, and it wasn't pre-planned, you're just, you're just trying to lower your average. You say, okay, I'm behind now, but I, if I buy some more here, my price will be lower, it'll be easy for me to bounce back. That's what's wrong, because what happens with that is you don't have the pre-planned exit. You can then end up having one trade blow up the whole account. So that's the problem of averaging down, not in that respect, is, is that you're trying to make it easier to recover, but if you're wrong on a trade, and you don't have an exit plan, you could really lose a lot on one trade. Yep, yep. Now that's a very key key lesson. Is no, yeah, knowing your risk basically is is a bit a big thing there, isn't it? And and not hoping that the the way you want it to go is that is what's going to happen. So that hope that hope is not a strategy sort of approach. So I've got some here. Paul believes best money is made at the market turns, which we've already sort of discussed. He he mentions that Elliott waves have been key to his success in this. Is that something you can touch on or? Well, yeah, I mean, the reason Elliot Wave, and I'm no Elliot, you know, Elliot Wave is nothing, anything that I, I particularly gravitated towards, although the concept kind of makes sense and markets have some sort of behavior. The problem I always have with Elliot Wave is defining them, you know, they always seem to, and if you look at people who used Elliot Waves, a lot of times they would say, oh, well, what I thought was this wave was really this wave, and it keeps on getting redefined. So, I personally am not a proponent of it, but there are people who use it successfully. And like my attitude is, anything that works for you, whether it makes sense or not, I don't care. Then that's fine. If it works, good. Now, for Paul, the reason why that worked is because he liked to look for stops to pick tops. So, Elliott wave was one tool. So, if it's the third wave, and the third wave extends to a certain price. And there's some other reasons to believe maybe there's some other resistance at that point or some other targets at that point or there's some fundamentals that suggest the market should turn, whatever. Then the, the LA wave combined with some other stuff is becomes one of the tools to identify a potential top or bottom. So that's why that's why that's why Paul Tudor Jones used it because it works well with your strategy. Would not work well, but it is amenable, I should say. It is amenable to a strategy that is looking for entry at tops, uh, the big tops and bottoms based on anticipated mm -hmm. areas of market reversal. Um, one of the fundamental rule uh, Paul has, um, I've read from your book, is buy, buy don't sell the breakout. Uh, if there is, he mentions that if there is a sudden range expansion in a market that has been trading narrowly, Human nature is to try to fade that price move. When you get a range expansion, the market is sending you a very loud, clear signal that the market is getting ready to move in the direction of that expansion. 
why do you think human nature is to to try and fade moves like that yeah because think about it um let's say you have a market in a long-term range and then you have a big breakout to a new high and a lot of times now you a lot of times those may be false breakouts and you know go down but there's a temptation the reason why there's a temptation to go short of that is because you sell there and guess what at that moment you're smarter than anybody who shorted the market anywhere in a, you know that whole period of that trend you know, you got the highest point the market's been at for that entire period so people do what feels good and so if you're putting on a position where that's the best entry for some period of time then well you know i got the best entry for some period that's that's a temptation i think that's why people do it uh, now you do get false breakouts so you can actually you could, could even argue that you could have a strategy where somebody does that and they have a way of getting out quickly if they're wrong whatever now well, paul i would em emphasize there thinking that the, the quote you got there he's talking about a range expansion so it's not merely a breakout because you get a lot of false breakouts uh, not so much more much more so now than when i interviewed him uh, but he's talking about a particular type of breakout it's not only the market's breaking out but it's having a big move it's like trading in a certain range and then it breaks out on a much wider range. So that's what he was referring to. And he's, he's saying there that, so you could say, it's almost like this new all time highs sort of, it's a bullish move basically. It's, it's a positive signal to. Yeah, he's saying, yeah, he's saying if you, if you get the breakout and the range expansion, uh, more often than not, that's, that's the market's telling you that it's gonna have another move. And we say, when we say range expansion, just to confirm it, it's a big, a, a, a big move in a certain direction yeah think of it as a think of it as a bar that's much bigger i call it a wide-ranging day yeah. okay well that's brilliant jack um if we could talk about your new book now that'd be great i just a, a little introduction for people we're gonna have obviously another podcast later on closer to the release date i think it's still about a month until it comes out um but obviously available for pre-order at the moment it'd be great to talk about that if you had uh, if you could describe it sure so the book is called Undiscovered Market Wizards. Uh, I'm not, not undiscovered, I'm sorry, Unknown Market Wizards. And I was working, I was actually going between those two titles, that's why it's something. So it's Unknown Market Wizards. And um, as the title suggests, the idea this, a lot of times the people I, I interviewed were well-known, like people like Ray Dahlia, right? Uh, Paul Tudor Jones even, when I interviewed him, he wasn't anything as widely known as he, he ultimately became. But at least he had established a number of years ago performance, and he was known to some extent. Um, so, uh, but a lot of so a lot of the past interviews were with people like that, and sometimes with people who were not known. But I and the book before this, the market was the book before this was hedge fund market was is where they were all known because they were all managing hedge funds. So this time, I wanted to go the other way. I wanted to go to just people who were completely unknown, really. I was looking for solo traders, not managing money, doing phenomenally, nobody knows they exist, that type of thing. Uh, now there's, well, there's except one person in the book, you know, there's a little bit of an exception because over recent years, he started blogging and, and sort of built up a wide following. So he's known in that sector, but he never, he never managed money. And, and so he's still not known like a hedge fund manager or whatever. But essentially I was looking for, and he still was only always like a solo trader. So that's what I was looking for. I was looking for the solo traders who are just doing their own thing, uh, doing phenomenally and nobody knows I exist. And the premise was that there are people out there that nobody knows that are just trading for themselves, that are doing better than the vast majority of professional managers. Uh, and I'm talking about hedge fund managers, not, you know. So, uh, and that also come, ties in a little bit to this concept of fund seeder, where the concept of fund seeder is that uh, it's a platform for traders. And the idea is that we would find traders who would log, who would link their accounts that had that were doing better than professional managers by trying to go globally. And indeed, I think it's like three or four of the traders from the book did come through, through fund seeder. So there are people who just like, wow. You know? Yeah, yeah. And you would never know that, you know, they just kind of trade their own account. Yeah. And they're trading um, quite a large size, like 
Not necessarily, not necessarily. Uh, I wasn't looking for, in some cases they were trading, you know, in some cases these people ended up being, uh, the people in the book ended up people who were trading tens of millions, but only because they had started out with small amounts and built it up, but not because, uh, but there was, the classic example is a person in the book who, um, uh, who never, and I put him in the book without hesitation, uh, even though his account was always between 50 to 100,000, which seems trivial, and why would he be in the book? Well, the reason the book is this particular fellow, uh, I actually, he, he, he's the ex bellhop uh, in Czechoslovakia, never had any money, started trading. I lost the first six months and I came back, but developed a methodology. And he, and he was on, he's one of the people I got off the front seat. So whenever I looked at the top 10, 10 people or whatever, he's always in there. And you look at his, his return chart, and it's like one of those mountain charts, you know, just goes steadily up. You know, every now and then a little dip. But we know it's real because we're getting, because he's a linked account, the returns come from the broker, not from him. So I knew it was real. So, so the story basically is, I mean, I found out that, Basically, Bill had no money, and the reason why the account's always fifteen hundred, because for the last fifteen years, he's been living. He makes, you know, he's got a fifty, sixty thousand dollar account. He makes fifty thousand dollars or whatever, forty thousand a year, lives off of it. So his account never grows because he's living off the money he's making. But he's trading large cap stocks, and the reason was because he figured if he ever made it, he didn't want to have to change the strategy. So the guy literally could be managing hundreds of millions or even a billion of the strategy. But he only has, nobody knows him. He's, like I say, an ex up living in a little village, a village of like 1,000 people in Czechoslovakia. You know, yeah, so I'm saying, so the fact is, now if he was, if he was like trading sort of like these micro stock, nobody, okay, now I wouldn't have concluded it, but he was trading stocks that, you know, super, super, you know, mega stocks. Um, and so the, he's developed a methodology that, kind of really has outstanding return to risk. And, uh, and for people from, I don't use a sharp, but in terms of, if you looked at a sharp, it would be like three or four or something like yeah. that, over the time period. That's incredible. And it's, um, obviously we'll dig into this in a lot more detail, uh, but if, if we could just sum up uh, to give people a little bit of an uh, insight about the book, what do you reckon the main difference in, between professional managers are and the people you saw, you know, these, these people, unknown market wizards, was there one sort of characteristic you think that allowed them to do well, uh, even though they didn't have that sort of professional, or was it? You no, know, no, not one, not one characteristic. It's like in all the books, there are multiple characteristics that people share. The method, the book, and none of them have to do with methodology because the methodology is always under the, everybody's yep, different. Yep. But, but they're all, you know, with almost invariably, They'll have a strong emphasis on risk management. Uh, they'll they'll find an approach that kind of really resonates with what their innate beliefs and skills are. Uh, that which is why the methodologies are always different because everybody has has a different skill or edge or interest. Um, they'll uh, they'll have the ability to. You know they have uh, they have real edges in their in their approaches such that they can have situations where their trade whatever it may be for their methodology sets up and they have very high conviction that, that that's a good trade so they they share the character there are lots of others they share those types of characteristics for the most part brilliant well it's really exciting and um, I'm really excited to read it. <laughs> Um, yeah. Where where can people find you, Jack? Where, where, where if they want to? Okay, so you know, so uh, as far as websites go, my website is jackschwager.com, just my name. dot com. Fun Cedar is Fun Cedar, just like it sounds. F U N D S E E D E R. dot com. And you know, the books uh, are all available, obviously, on Amazon. You know. Search my name on Amazon or Market Wizards on Amazon or whatever. They're also on my website, but you know. And uh, it's about a month, is it, to the book comes out, but you can still pre order it now. 
Com official, yeah, official publication date is November 3rd. And so the, the print copy, the email, the email, the ebook, and uh, the audio all will come out around that, Brilliant. that date. Well, thanks very much, Jack. Really appreciate it. Bye bye. Thank you. Cool. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest to you. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during a trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new podcasts, stock reports or events from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. Until next time.